So uh, welcome everyone, and thanks a lot for joining in. So I'm Jeff. I'm located in North Carolina, if you didn't hear some of the conversation we just had. And I'm joined by my colleague, Alessandro, from Torino, Italy. Hi, and everyone. It, that's right. And it's, it's pretty late for the, in the day for him, so uh, he should have a glass of wine with him. I don't know why he doesn't. <laughs> Actually, but, let's say um, that I was not sharing the screen. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm confident that what we have for you today is a great discussion on a really exciting topic. And recent events around the world, as you know, have taught us that processing and interpreting volumes of data is really important for both business continuity and enhancing end user experiences. Enterprises are turning to AI, to machine learning, to analytics, to make the right inferences from all of that data. So here I'm going to talk about how enterprises are challenged to get that important AI project into production while satisfying all the requirements for being deployed across multiple environments with security and with manageability. So we'll go on to the next slide. Yep. There you go. And we're going to start with uh, challenges and a little bit about strategy and go on to the next one. So organizations around the world apply AI technologies to transform business in ways that will reinvent how firms win, serve, and retain customers. Businesses are under pressure to evolve quickly and optimize processes, maximize revenue streams, track trends, and develop new business models using digital technologies. AI has emerged as a core capability which every organization must leverage in order to be an industry player. It takes leadership, a knowledgeable workforce, and a mix of the right tools to see success, but an AI infrastructure is also required to expand and infuse that intelligence into practical use cases. So I wanted to start out with a baseline set of assertions. And the first one is that the upsurge of data does not automatically translate into business improvements without leveraging AI or machine learning to turn that data into insights. That may be obvious, but getting there can be a rocky road. And the second is that businesses will increasingly leverage machine learning as more data is collected through IoT sensors, through edge devices, through cloud sources. Machine learning is how we discover patterns in massive amounts of data and make inferences based on those patterns. The third one uh, introduces what I call practical AI, where AI machine learning is used to gain insights and infer something that becomes more useful in everyday life. Where the unexpected is inferred, it results in positive outcomes, and I refer to this as practical AI. And that leads into the fourth assertion I have here, that practical AI strengthens the trust people start to have in it. And this shines a, a light on dark data and leads to decisions that can positively affect not only our businesses, but our everyday lives. If you go on to the next slide. So AI has emerged as rapidly becoming instrumental in driving the insights that empower businesses in today's connected world. Uh, organizations today need to find complex relationships in large amounts of data and predict things that either cut costs or create value. AI can help minimize mistakes, reduce the probability of human error, and improve overall business efficiency. AI helps customize and automate large volumes of data and content, which has the capacity to improve productivity and creativity. So before we can start reaping the benefits of AI, there are some obvious factors that organizations should consider along the journey. First is strategy. In order for people, process, and technology to function seamlessly, an AI strategy must be clear, concise, and adaptable. Second is people. The right people with the right digital skills are critical to successfully leveraging AI technology to transform the business. Talent can make or break digital transformation objectives. The third one is process. It's no surprise that firms of all sizes are facing a lack of both well-curated data to train AI systems and formalized processes to assess key business challenges. And last but not least is technology. On one hand, AI needs the utilization of other technology tools 
to execute its tasks efficiently. On the other hand, it requires employees to trust the technology. AI can drive, drive the insights that empower businesses as long as we can overcome this technology barrier. So here, let's start with strategy a little bit. So AI success requires a formalized investment strategy. The first step on the left is to understand how and where data is being captured and stored. For data analytics, we need to understand where the anal analysis will occur and how much data movement will be involved. Are these high performance environments? Is it edge, cloud, hybrid, on-premise? How will the data be used? To get to an end game where we have a production grade AI project that generates iterative insights that feed into business decisions, it all starts with data science and with modeling. Predictive modeling that relies on machine learning or even deep learning will eventually lead to unexpected inferences that could have a major impact on the business and the services provided. So this is, again, practical AI that can be trusted and can positively affect practical or everyday lives as well as businesses. For people, we also need to ensure the right skills are available that can leverage AI technology and eventually transform the business. Whether you need to develop these skills in-house, hire in some data scientists, or get advice from outside consultants and suppliers, it's pretty likely that your workforce will need to adapt to handle this. The chart here shows a really good list of skill sets that would be useful for AI, from the data analysts to the engineers to the data scientists. It also includes everything from statistical programming to machine learning techniques to data visualization. Pretty good table there. Next slide. So as far as process goes, so the process to achieve a production model is key to eventually improving efficiencies in business and in IT operations. AI is kind of like an iceberg where everyone focuses on the visible top layer, the shiny application layer, but forgets what is under the water, the big part. And that's seen as simply an infrastructure problem in some ways. How to get the data, how to clean and prepare the data, how to build models into production ready artifacts, how to manage workloads and scalability. That's all under the water. The goal here is to eliminate the complexity of the AI infrastructure through a more holistic approach that spans from services to infrastructure to support. The challenge is to get the AI project into production while satisfying all the requirements for being deployed across multiple environments with security and with manageability. We know data scientists are not infrastructure experts and DevOps operators are not AI experts, but data scientists need workloads that can be changed as the underlying hardware changes. And data scientists and AI operators both need software building blocks and guidance on deployment, as well as how to manage remotely. And a lot of the work that we've been doing um, inside SUSE is trying to address those challenges. And that's something that, uh, that Alessandro in a few minutes will, will demo for us as well. You can go to the next slide. Ultimately, it comes down to technology and the tools and packages that will be used to unlock the insights from the data analysis. An AI stack, such as what is shown here, provides a guidepost that businesses can use in developing the right environment and models for AI projects. There are many technology decisions to be made along the way, starting at the bottom of the diagram, what hardware platforms and accelerators are available to you? Where will your analytics applications be deployed, monitored and managed? Where will the data be collected and then analyzed? What additional infrastructure or container orchestration and management might be needed? For application orchestration, how will your pipelines and workflows be developed and validated? And also what additional machine learning or neural network libraries and tools will be needed in developing AI containers. And once you have these building blocks or this reference architecture, this end-to-end -end technology guidance, 
you can achieve an optimized infrastructure for your AI project that fits within your architectural environments. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it over to Alessandro now. And like I said, he's gonna go through a demo. Um, hopefully it works live. And Alessandro, over to you. Thank you, Jeff. And actually, well, I will try to do even something more risky that is like two demos in one. So literally two products in one single demo. So de definitely, definitely, I'm challenging the gods of demos tonight. <laughs> so let's see how it goes. So let's start from addressing the challenge. Actually, Jeff did an amazing job in describing the what we call the artificial iceberg. Um, that explain in a comparison how AI could be more complex than what it seems. So in order to explain a little bit more, let me start from uh, what we observe being uh, a day-to-day -day of, of a data scientist or maybe of a company that actually want to run AI information. So let me start with this story. We got two personas here. Uh, the lady here is our data scientist. We call her Jim, while the guy uh, is our DevOps, uh, and we call it Sasha. Um, let's say that Jean has been tasked to solve a specific use case. It could be, could be basically any. It's about maybe, I don't know, maybe identify health issue in a healthcare uh, scenario. So she has to build a model that looking at the MRI scan can identify properly any issue. And then the, the idea is that at the very end, we will basically pass this model, this training model to the inference server where we can apply it to the application. So we will have a, let's call it between brackets, a smart application that helps doctors to identify any health issue before time. Now, what typically Jean does as a data scientist is she writes probably locally uh, on an interactive environment like a Jupyter notebook. She writes a model uh, using a, a chunk of the original data set. She explores different models uh, to analyze and get uh, a good result, at least what she, she observes as a, as, a, as a good result, with enough precision, with enough uh, performance, and so on. But then she has to embed this model in, a, in what we call an AI pipeline. And what is an AI pipeline? An AI pipeline is the full step end-to-end -end of the entire scenario. The data that comes in, in a form of a batch or a real-time streaming, the way we manipulate this data, how we apply the model to the data and we train the model, eventually analyzing different models and deciding which one apply better. And then finally, how we output the model and pass the model directly to the inference, to the serving models, uh, to serve the model to the inference. Now, in order to create a, such a pipeline, typically we have to use a platform and there are multiple platforms out there uh, to name a few, Qflow, Argo, Apache Airflow, and, and so on whether they are running as a, within a cloud provider offering or on-prem offering. And maybe you even have a multiple environments scenario where you have a dev, test, and production environment. Now, the problem is that Jis is not an infrastructure expert. She knows everything about mathematical model, but she doesn't know almost anything about uh, infrastructure, about containers, about how to embed the model within the platform. Because in order to do so, she should have to use uh, a specific meta language, an SDK. Let's take for the sake of this presentation, Qflow. In order to run and, and create a pipeline on Qflow, you probably have to use the SDK from Qflow, KFP, and DSL. And you have to write it in a way that actually that allow it ask you many, many information. Sasha, on the other hand, he knows this information. He knows what a container is. He knows how to optimize a container. He probably knows even how to optimize the infrastructure per se. But again, Sasha doesn't know anything about gene work. He doesn't know anything about data science. And he doesn't anything know about the pipeline that Gene has in mind. So they are stuck there. They are basically trying to collaborate, but actually there are many, many issues there. So to visualize better what I'm just saying, this is a, a simple example of, 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 the, of the flow. On the left, that's the Jupyter notebook. That's the part that's being written by Gene. And probably it's being written in Jupyter notebook, so it's an entire Python environment, so it gives our results. On the right, that is uh, the graph of a Qflow pipeline. And each box there is a specific step. And each step is a specific container with its own specific arguments and, and its capability, like the outputs of a file if you need it, and so on. 
The part in the center, that is the meta language I was mentioning there. So one of the two, Sasha or Jean, has to learn how to write that and has to learn how to execute that. And as you can see, the part in the center is not really data science and is not really pure infrastructure, pure DevOps kind of. It's more a mix of that. So that end up in a scenario where you can have multiple data scientists, few DevOps that can learn or, or knows how to run the pipelines and uh, they really struggle with collaborating. So we thought that because we are an infrastructure company, because we, our DNA is to solve those infrastructure challenges, we can help out there. And so we start with a project called an AI Orchestrator. And the Orchestrator basically try to solve this, this struggling or this pain, if you want. So let me rewrite a little bit our flow. Gene writes a model as before, nothing changes there. The only thing that it changes is that we ask Gene to save everything she writes in a Git repository. GitHub, GitLab, Bamboo, as long as it's Git, private, public, it doesn't matter. The second thing is we, we, we do this because first we can leverage versioning from Git, uh, from the Git repos. And the second thing is that we can automatically be triggered by this uh, Git repo. So if things changes, we can automatically trigger a new pipeline. And I'm using pipeline, the term pipeline on purpose here. So Jean writes a model. She has no clue about meta languages. She has no clue about the pipeline per se. She has a design in mind probably. Maybe she would be happy if, he can, if she can design this graphically, but that's it. That's all, all she knows. Now, once she's ready with the models, she basically uploads her artifacts to the SUSE orchestrator. And basically she will just input few information like the name of the pipeline, the description of a pipeline to help out Sasha later to identify what she's going to do there, the steps that she want to execute. Um, with the artifacts, she, she saved it. If there was a script, the way we can run these scripts. Is it Python? Is it Julia? Is it R? We just need to have a, the definition of the steps. And that's it. That's all she has to do. Sasha will receive a notification that says, hey, one of your data scientists just uploaded a new pipeline. What happened actually in the meantime is that we transformed those artifacts in a compliant pipeline with single or multiple steps, apply a template that can be the default template or a customized version of a template so that Sasha can actually change the parameters, the containers, the arguments, the things that actually he knows uh, mostly of, and at the same time, we can run this new pipeline template against any of the target that you see on this slide. So literally we transform a, a universe in a universal meta language that allow you to run the pipeline against this platform without having to rewrite your code. And even more, Sasha at that point can schedule the pipeline. If you have a, the multiple environment scenario, like I described it before, dev, test, production, then actually Sasha can literally use that and, and decided that you run on dev, then you will trigger if it's successful to run it on, 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 on test. And then if it's triggered, if you run it successfully on product direct, directly. And maybe in the meantime, just reapply different templates. Now, again, because visual is better than, than just describing things, I'm going to, to go directly for the live demo. But as I said, I want to run a really special demo. Uh, it's two demos in one. So let me, let me explain this. Let me, first of all, let's see if I can actually move this guy here. So you see all you, you can see better. And let me just do a little bit more zoom here. So the first step was, I wanna write a pipeline and I wanna simulate what Gina has to do every day. And then I wanna have a simple way the orchestrator um, to run this pipeline. But I want to do a little bit more. And this little bit more is about, I'd like to have an environment on my own laptop that is really similar to what I will find in the data center. Let's say that I want to run the Qflow pipeline on my own laptop. And possibly I want to also have, well, eventually the orchestrator as well, but I want to install every kind of AI tool or platform I want to test out so that basically I can literally design and create my own end-to-end -end scenario easily. And then just at that point, move everything to the data center. 
seamlessly. In order to do so, I'm going to use another open source project that we release that I will describe a minute after the demo. This is called a K2 AI. K2 AI is a simple way to install every AI tools, every AI platform you like, including supporting GPUs, including supporting WSL, directly in your laptop or any edge devices, and then start experiment from there. So my goal is I want to have Kubeflow pipeline and I want to start from a notebook. So I need to have a Jupyter notebook. So all I have to do is just go to the k website, decide that I want to have the Jupyter notebooks and I have the whole stack of Jupyter notebook. I will take the minimal one, the minimal notebook, click there and I want to install everything for me. And to demonstrate that I have my environment ready. So I already pre-installed the pipeline because for the sake, for the sake of time, but as you can see here, there's no Jupyter there. So all I have to do is just copy and paste that, uh, the steps, adding a flag that says, well, because you already installed uh, K3AI, you can skip the cluster installation. So let me, oops, it seems like I have a, okay. K3S and then run it you will see that basically one single line of command, I'm not doing anything. You see Jupyter appearing here, is defining the ingress so I can basically just take the URL of this Jupyter and do it. And you will see that I will do even a bunch of stuff. I'm going to use this Jupyter with Qflow pipeline. So I suppose to have the meta language installed, KFP. And in fact, the automation installation is doing everything for me. I don't have to know anything about Kubernetes. I don't know how to do anything on my side all I have to do is just sit the ear, waiting, and get a URL at the end and using it. So I could be a data scientist, and still I'm starting to make usage of AI without effort. Now let's wait for a couple of seconds. Everything's done. You can see the URL here, and just copy and paste the URL. Come back here, paste my URL, and I got the full Jupyter workbook there. Now. In order to demonstrate that actually I'm doing something real, I'm taking a public example from Qflow. So first step, now I got the Qflow pipeline and the Jupyter notebook up and running my laptop so I can experiment. I want to learn the SDK just to demonstrate how complex is building pipelines. Nothing wrong with that, but there's a friction there. I'm a data scientist. I'm not an expert. So I'm taking this notebook. This notebook comes from the public example of Qflow. So I'm going to save the notebook as it is. And I'm going to upload my new up notebook into my environment. As you can see, this is not coding. It's just simply click and done. Open the notebook. It's exactly the same notebook as before. All I have to do is just taking notes of my URL and then start to execute in the notebook. I'm not going to execute the first cell because KFP already been installed for me. So I'm going to execute the first cell. I'm going to execute the second cell. And you see that I have no error because everything is already preset for me. The third cell, this is pretty stupid pipeline. It's just do a calculation and it will be there. So almost at the end, I'm ready to compile I'm adding one single thing that the URL of my Qflow local pipeline, that was the URL I, I took from, from here and then execute it. And if everything goes right, when I click here, it will open up Qflow pipeline for me with the pipeline running an experiment running for me. I did not have to do anything. It was so easy that literally in three minutes, I'm literally running a pipeline. So I can spend my time learning the stuff that I, I care of. I can spend my time learning KFP. But now let's do a step back. So first half of the demo, k I've done. Good. Let's do a step back. This notebook just did all these steps in the very end just to do a sum. This simple calculation. You take two numbers and you sum them. That's it. So in terms of script, I simplify a little bit the script. It's just something like that. You pass me a couple of arguments, you print out the arguments, that's it. 
So in order to run this in a pipeline, I had basically to build something like this. Again, nothing wrong with that, but the degree of complexity is higher and higher and higher. Of course, there's also the degree of flexibility. It allows me to do almost everything I like, but it adds a lot of complexity as usual. So can I basically avoid that? So let's try it with the SUSE orchestrator. Just to demonstrate what I have here, I have a full environment with my Qflow pipeline locally, Qflow pipeline on AWS. I potentially can have also Argo that is another platform. So let's redo the same stuff, but this time directly from the orchestrator. I'm Gene now. You will see all the options all together. I'm not going to log out, log in just for the sake of the demo. I click on the pipeline, give a name. Uh, let's say demo pipeline. I'm going just to say, in this case, because we are going to release the project. So in my demo environment, I expose the Docker image for, for me to control better the demo. Otherwise, in the final version, this part will be not seen. I'm going to put a custom image because I want to really do as, be as much as flexible. And I'm going to use a specific uh, container like TensorFlow. Again, this part will be exposed to the DevOps, not to the scientists. I'm just using these for the demo purpose. And then I can ask for basically the, the demo requirement. Let's say that I'm doing something like that. So what is this? This is exactly what I wrote here. Take two arguments in input and sum them. That's all I do. So I come here, I just pass my Git repo. Eventually I can pass my branch if I have multiple branches. You remember the versioning things and just submit it. That's all I have to do. My job is done as a data scientist. Now, the DevOps receive a notification. Maybe I, as a data scientist, I have the same uh, role, so I can go straight away to the workloads. I go to the workload, I see the demo. There's a request for a new demo there. I can schedule a run, and I see all the, all the uh, platform connected to me. So I literally, I can decide that I want to run on both of them at the same time and run it. And so what happened is that when I come here and I open up, here's a, a demo running there, is a pipeline. And if I open up here, here's another demo running. What is happening? I just pass a script. We are building an entire pipeline. We create a disk for you based on the configuration of the orchestrator. We are collecting the data as expected. Once the data is collected, we will basically do the calculation for you. And once everything will be run, we will expose the outcome to you. We will send you the outcome so you will get the results there. So literally we create a pipeline. And it's exactly the same pipeline as before in this exactly the same kind of flavor the, independently from the platform you're using. You have to not to learn KFP. You have to not learn anything about the the platform, you can simply get the results out, evaluate them, and eventually move out. But this is not enough because that's okay if it is a fast iteration kind of workload. Maybe I wanna do something more um, complex. So I said before, well, ideally, the data science knows how to build the, um, the pipeline. So maybe you wanna design the pipeline upfront and that's why we are introducing the, the Composer. The Composer is a way, and it's still in development. We will release the orchestrator more or less at the end of November as an open source project. It's a way to build your pipeline dynamically. For each step, you can say what you want to do. Uh, let's say something like that. And then the step is there. And then you can literally create the pipeline and save it as a template. So it's an agnostic pipeline. You simply design your flow, you pass the information that you have at that time, you save it as a template. And the template is here. And what is a template? Is a template is a, is a way to write the pipeline in a universal way. So let me, for example, uh, give you an example. I, I'm going to create a new template for Qflow since we are using Qflow. 
leveraging one of my templates. Then I will download the templates just to explain you how it works. And uh, so the... submit it. Now I'm coming back to our original workload and rerun the same workload and this time only on local. And I'm going to use the demo template this time. And the pipeline will be executed exactly as before, but this time it will be a complete different time pipeline. In order to visualize better this, I changed the names of, of, uh, of the steps. And I, of course, adding some, some other steps just to explain them. So the collecting data as, as before is collecting everything and then it's executing. But this time, instead of executing one step, it will execute on multiple steps at the same time. Now, of course, because of demo proposal, we cannot wait everything for that. But actually, you can see that I'm executing and evaluating other models. And depending on the results, I'm, I'm basically moving from one to another and, and go. You see, actually, that the pipeline is completely different. Now, you can probably point out, yes, but how are these to build that? The composer showed me the graphical capability to design the pipeline. I can visualize my, the, my pipeline up front. The templates allow me to go to the extreme. This is for the DevOps. So let me download my template and open it up for you. There you go. And I'm just do something like that. Zoom in, and then I'll zoom in just to give you a little bit more readiness capabilities. And I'm going to take this. So you will see that it's pretty similar to KFP for those that know KFP, but also to M charts. For example, we're using variables within that, so you don't have to write them. The volume size, the storage class, even the container name, the container name image, are all variables you pass directly from the orchestrator. We will, by inheritance, we will take them. So you don't have to rewrite them. All you have to care is just passing the right command and the command is split pretty quickly here. So you can basically just do the command. You just give a name to the step and they decide when the step it runs after what. That's it. You learn once, you reuse multiple times on any kind of platform. And that's the beauty of the orchestrator. Once it's done, you basically just upload it here as before, and then you immediately apply to your pipeline. And with that, basically, I'm finishing my two demos. The gods of demos definitely were uh, really nice with me to, today. So let me come back to the demo. So back to Creator AI. So orchestrator is mint and we will release end of November as open source project is meant to help data scientists and DevOps to collaborate and to orchestrate the pipeline of multiple environment, no matter where those environment are and no matter which kind of environment are. This way you can optimize the workloads, you can optimize the way you run the pipeline and you're sure that whenever you run it, it runs successfully because it's pre-built for you. Of course, you can create your custom templates so you have a degree of customization and flexibility there. k AI is aging infrastructure for AI. The goal of k AI that is already being documented on the Qflow uh, community um, documentation, for example, is to make the life of AI citizens or AI professional easier when it comes to experiment and start with AI tools. So as you can see, we already have a, a good list of things we are working there. Um, those k ai uh, in allow you to start immediately. You can install Qflow pipelines with, with CPUs, with GPUs. Argo workflows is already, um, there's a type is not anymore a work in progress. Argo workflow is already supported. TensorFlow serving is already supported. We got WSL support. So for those that are on Windows, they can literally use Windows Assistant for Linux to install everything. All the Jupyter stacks are there and we are looking for contributors. It's an open source project, you can, go there, consume it, or if you like, you can contribute there. We are going to add Python, PyTorch serving as well and TensorFlow serving um, as well as said. So k ai means you can install it on everything, literally everything. We even support ARM because it's based on well-known Rancher k as behind the scenes. And in fact, we are going to release also Argo for ARM um, on that. And literally, 
it's at the distance of a one single command, the one that is involved here. You can literally see that in one single command, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to care about anything. We will take care of all complexity. You just need to start and play with the tools. And combining those two things, it comes to the idea that Jeff was describing before, the AI stack. And the AI stack is exactly that, is the, let's say the enterprise version of this is about making complex things easier faster and ready to be run at your disposal at the distance of a click. And in fact, the iStack is made of an operating system optimized for the accelerator architecture underneath, for the platforms underneath x86ARM, with storages that, that are fit for those accelerators that are not to be integrated with this operating system like SUSE Enterprise Storage. With Orchestrator, you probably all know about Susan Ranger. Um, we cannot actually claim anything because it's not complete, but to give you an idea, even of the flexibility, everything you see here can come from Susan, but can even come from third party. You can have the flexibility. There's no vendor looking. You don't like the storage from Susan. You can add any other storage. We will take care just of the combination between us and partners we have to have a stack that's still working. The orchestrator, fit perfectly on the infrastructure orchestrator in a manner that actually allow you to do move to the next uh, layer that is the platforms. Qflow, Airflow, Argo, and so on. k 2 eventually could be part of it. And on top of that, you can use any container that run your own pipeline. So basically you have a, a full seamless infrastructure in one single stack, fully supported end-to-end -end by SUSE and still completely compliant with the open source um, DNA and policies. So the first to AML development means that, and we just demonstrated that, it should be fast enough for me to experiment, to use templates, optimize it for specific environments like GPU accelerators, and customize it for my need. Even when it comes to data center, even when it comes in a hybrid scenario between on-prem and cloud, it should be able to be configured for multiple environments for the same pipelines. As we demonstrated before, Maybe, or better, I should have, if I want to run AI in production, dev, test, production. But I don't want to rewrite every time the pipe. I don't want to re-optimize the pipe every time completely, writing again every single step. I want to just reuse. I, don't, I want to avoid all the manual steps there that takes a lot of time, well, longer time at least, and they expose me to human errors. It should be pre built automation workflows because it, com it removes the complexity, but also it allows me to even have a degree of automation that otherwise I cannot reach out. As said, we are leveraging the, the capability to use Git repos, but it's not just that. When you use Orchestrator, you, I show you the UI, this amazing UI made by the, our UX team. And I hope you perceive the simplicity of this usage. It was so simple that you don't have to learn. Everything was clear and intuitive. But, and there's a, an amazing job by our UX team to do that. But for each functionality you saw, there's an equivalent API. We design everything in UX API first. One UI functionality, one API, one-to-one. -one. That means that you can literally embed the orchestrator within any platform, any, any application you have, any infrastructure you have, and make it completely transparent. transparent. Let's say you're using, I don't know, Azure DevOps, or you're using Jira or GitHub Actions. You can literally call the API from the orchestrator and orchestrate the pipeline that from there. The, this is the output pilot guidance uh, meaning to drive the AI operator to the entire deployment experience. And overall, we try to reduce the friction accelerator project with test and maintain a solution. So that was all I got more or less from my side. And I ask you, Jeff, if you want to chime in for that, if you have any questions, feel free to reach me out. I hope you perceive there. There's more and more about AI. Um, for example, we, as soon as we release and maintain a, a, a good list of packages um, for the machine learning frameworks, means if you're running on SUSE and OpenSUSE, typically you use to install packages, a common line called a zipper. Zipper install something. So we made it easier to install also the machine learning framework. Zipper in TensorFlow, Zipper in PyTorch, 
so you don't have to care, to care about thinking how to do so, even on SUSE and OpenSUSE. If you want to try out um, I, our, our high performance computing solution, we, have, we can use those packages within that. And there's even more and more uh, GPU support and so on. And of course, we also contributed upstream to Qflow. So for example, we release um, a manifest for Qflow to support non-Docker runtime, like the PNS runtimes. And we added more and more. K3i is another addition to the Qflow documentation to help out AI folks to, to start with. And with that, I and said- really, And Alessandro, just want to interject. Yeah, so yeah. everything you showed and everything we, we both talked about, it's really to accelerate the AI project, making it yes. easier to get that project into production where we can really start to get the insights and the feedback and things that will affect the businesses. So that's yeah. that's what this is really all about, orchestrating it, automating it, and, and getting to production quicker. Yeah, and uh, you're absolutely right, Jeff, because the, the meaning is exactly that, is making life simpler up to the point where you don't perceive the complexity. And I hope that, for example, in my demo that was perceived, I basically literally drive the demo, click from one point to another, get results without any, any, any complexity, any friction there. And so I hope that folks that actually are, are looking into the presentation have questions and or eventually even feedback because we are definitely open for that. that that's basically the SUSE way to be open and because that's what we claim. We are the open, open source company.